So thank you everyone for joining today. I'm sorry we're starting a couple of minutes late and I suspect others will join us shortly. I wanted to welcome you to this webinar. Um, as with any crisis, COVID has brought a lot of uncertainty. Those running libraries and library systems have found themselves needing to take decisions that were previously almost unthinkable quickly. While in some countries there has been direct instructions about what to do, a lot of the time libraries have been given a lot of space to work out what makes sense or otherwise around some pretty significant questions around how to handle materials, how to manage workflows. Of course, governments themselves too have been forced to take decisions and make recommendations about a situation with a disease, with a virus that they do not and cannot fully understand. In order to support this work, it's great to have the Realm Reopening Archives, Libraries and Museums project, working not just to gather the information to help in this decision making, but also to identify where more is needed and to fill these gaps. We're therefore very happy today to welcome Kendra Morgan, Senior Program Manager at OCLC, to share some of the work that's been carried out as part of the Realm project. She'll be presenting on the project and what this includes, and we'll be leaving time at the end so that you can ask questions to this purpose, to this end. Please do make use of the questions and answer function within Zoom. I imagine that you're very familiar with this, but if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll have, ref you'll have the Q&A button. So please do enter your questions in there as you go along. But without further, to do, further ado, I'm very happy to hand over to Kendra. Kendra, please. Thank you, Stephen. I'm going to share my screen so we can see some slides. And that should be showing up for you. And I just want to thank all of you uh, for joining us here today. Uh, my name is Kendra Morgan. And as Stephen said, I'm a senior program manager here at OCLC. And I am working as a program manager very specifically on the Realm project. And uh, Realm stands for Reopening Archives, Libraries, and Museums. And it's a research partnership between OCLC the Institute of Museum and Library Services uh, and a research institute called Battelle. And I'll talk a little bit more about the partnership in a bit. Uh, but the aim of the, the partnership is to conduct research on how long the COVID-19 virus survives on materials that are prevalent in libraries and museums uh, and considerations that might be uh, taken as those institutions think about how to handle those materials and mitigate exposure to staff and visitors. Um, all of the resources that I'm going to be talking about today and the research that I'm sharing are available on the Realm website. And you can see that URL here on the screen. It's just oc.lc slash realm hyphen project. And when we get to the Q&A portion, I'll pop a few more links into the chat as well um, but everything is there and it's shareable um, you can use those materials in your own discussions uh, in your institution uh, and aside from the q a at the end of the session today there's also going to be uh, ways that you can reach out with your own questions So really quickly, um, the Institute of Museum and Library Services is the primary source of federal support for libraries and museums here in the United States. Uh, its mission is to advance, support, and empower America's museums, libraries, and related organizations through grant making, research, and policy development. As the project funder, IMLS really catalyzed this research partnership and their ongoing role is to consult on the project goals and activities. And they also convene a steering committee and two working groups uh, that are advising the project. The second organization is Battelle, which is a scientific research institute uh, headquartered in Columbus, Ohio, and they have done extensive research in public health, consumer, industrial, and national security. Uh, and they also have an extensive history of doing research on emerging and infectious diseases. And then OCLC was brought into the project to lead and manage the execution of the project deliverables. So we are coordinating Battelle scientific research and we collect and synthesize the input from the two working groups that I mentioned, as well as the steering committee. And we're also connecting with subject matter experts in the field. 
So we have established a cross-sector communication network, which has dozens of associations and organizations that support libraries, archives, and museums to get information about the project and pass it on to their constituents and likewise bring it back to us. So presentations and activities like these are a key for us to be able to share what the project is doing and how we are working with the community. So again, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, because getting the published research and disseminating it out to the field is really critical to the project so that people can use it as part of their local decision making. There are quite a few key activities for this project and I'll speak to these as we go through the session. Uh, the first is to conduct literature reviews of published science to see what is emerging about COVID-19 that can be applicable to libraries, archives, and museums. We also continually engage with subject matter experts and representatives from the field uh, to help inform the project planning processes and as well as the laboratory testing of materials, which is really one of the key deliverables for the project. And it was of high interest to the library community uh, here in the United States. Uh, we are taking all of the inputs uh, and synthesizing them into what we call toolkit resources. And these are resources that apply the science to the real world practices and operations of libraries and museums. And like the project research, these are published as they are available and we learn more about the needs of our constituents. So the scope of the realm research is to provide information to better understand SARS-CoV-2, uh, which is the virus which causes COVID-19. And that's what the goal of informing local decision making and the development of operational practices and policies. You know, during the introduction, Stephen was noting how very different all of our communities are and that we're looking at both you know, our local governments, as well as provincial or state and federal national uh, decision making that all have to be taken into account. So it's important to note that Realm isn't making specific recommendations because we know that that really needs to be a local decision. Uh, every institution is so different and will need to develop policies that work for them and their community. Um, we also understand that this is unprecedented, I keep thinking is, is going to be the word of 2020, but it's truly an unprecedented situation and the enormous staff that staff in organizations are under. And we're learning and adapting and listening as we go through. And one of the challenges is that we just want to know what is best and how to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. And for many of our institutions, this applies to how we work with staff and public and our physical collections, as well as our built buildings. So I want to talk a little bit about that idea of uncertainty um, and how challenging this pandemic is to the work of libraries and, and really to, to the entirety of our lives. Um, there is so much uncertainty and so many questions. Uh, and for information professionals, especially, who want to be able to answer questions for people, it's really hard to sit with that uncertainty. Uh, so many people are trying to do the right thing. Uh, they want to support the health of staff, um, of the organizations that they serve, as well as the public, which depends on our services. Um, and when things change uh, and new information becomes available, uh, or maybe worse, no new information, we have to deal with that uncertainty and, and really a timeline that is not our own. An article that came out in September in uh, BMJ, which is um, the British Medical Journal, um, has really been helpful to a lot of the project team members in outlining and acknowledging this kind of uncertainty. Uh, and the authors lay out five rules for managing uncertainty in the pandemic. And I've just really found this to resonate with the work that we're doing, with what we hear in the field um, from people who are giving us feedback. And the first rule um, is, that, is to understand that most data will be flawed or incomplete and to be honest and transparent about that. 
So one way I can say that the realm data is incomplete is that we can't test every item um, under multiple conditions to answer all questions and all of the interests of the libraries, archives, and museums community. We can't test at 20 different temperatures over multiple days um, under multiple conditions. And so the data is going to be incomplete. The next is that for some questions, certainty or a final answer may never be reached. So consider whether or not you want to wait for a definitive evidence to act um, or use the evidence that you have. And with Realm, we are choosing to publish information about the longevity of the SARS-CoV-2 virus on materials as they become available to us. We are acting and sharing what we have and will continue to do that. The third point is to make sense of complex situations by both um, acknowledging the complexity, admitting your ignorance to questions. So if you ask me things today that I don't know, I will tell you and I will follow up. I'll get you um, as much information as I can, um, but there are things that we just don't know. Luckily, we have a great team behind the scenes that I can turn to uh, for additional help and support, but um, there are things that I simply won't know. Uh, and acknowledging that there are paradoxes among, among um, these two issues. So um, the collective reflection um, is particularly important, um, being able to uh, explore the paradoxes uh, within a group of people who in their daily work are really supporting lifelong learning in their communities. Uh, we can learn from each other and acknowledge what we don't know and still continue to move forward. So next up is that different people and different groups of stakeholders are going to interpret data differently. Deliberation among stakeholders may generate multifaceted solutions, and we can benefit from multiple perspectives and ideas as we work towards policy decisions. And then finally, pragmatic interventions carefully observed and compared in real world settings can generate useful data uh, that can complement the findings of controlled trials and other forms of evidence. Uh, we may need to try new things when they are supported by data and our policies will need to evolve. And with that, we're, we're really trying to encourage people to make, make it clear that your policies are evolving and that you are looking at how things are changing and that your your policies and procedures are going to change as you learn more. Um, I think especially what we saw very early in the pandemic in terms of how long people were choosing to quarantine materials or if they were doing that at all, whatever local decision they made, whether or not their building was open, so much has changed um, as we're now going into another wave of, of cases people are having to reconsider how they are implementing policies and procedures because the information changed. So I'll post the, the link to this uh, when we get to the Q&A section. It's a short article, but I do just really find it um, level setting in terms of, of understanding how we engage with each other, uh, the people that we're trying to serve. So in line with that, admitting what we don't know, uh, I wanted to touch on a few known unknowns that are really um, core to a lot of the work that we're doing right now, um, because there are several things we don't know about COVID-19 or the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And these are really important to acknowledge when having this conversation with people about setting policies, maybe why you're choosing to be cautious around certain aspects um, and why you make decisions. So the first is that we don't know how many virus cells an infected person leaves behind on an object through sneezing or coughing. There has been lots of research. It's a challenging thing to research when you think about um, the challenges of being in a room with someone who is actively infected uh, with COVID-19 and how to capture that how different our sneezes are as a real simple baseline. Um, a small child may sneeze very differently from um, a, a man who's 100 kilos or you know, 220 pounds. So 
that uncertainty is something that we don't know. So if I sneeze and there's a book in front of me and I don't have a, uh, a handkerchief, I don't know what I'm going to leave behind. So the second is how many virus cells someone can pick up from an object. So if I handle a book that someone else has sneezed on, we don't know how much is likely to transfer. We do know, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later, that fomite transfer, touching things that have been infected, is not thought to be a primary way that COVID-19 spreads, but we don't know what this transfer does look like. And then finally, we don't know how many virus cells are needed to cause infection. So other studies, other viruses have shown a wide range of infection and scientists are continuing to explore this issue, but things like the flu, other strains of coronavirus, they all have different infection levels and from person to person, this is going to vary as well. So this is a, for all accounts, a relatively new pandemic, and it's going to take a lot of time and effort in order to be able to answer these questions. But sharing these known unknowns with your stakeholders, including staff, can be helpful in understanding, again, why policies and procedures may change and why we need to adapt. So that's a lot about the unknowns. Let's talk a little bit about what we do know and the status of some of the project research. And we'll start by looking what we do understand about the virus. So part of the project, uh, the Realm project, has been to conduct literature reviews to specifically look at what's out there that can help to inform library, museum, and archive operations. So the first literature review was published in June, and uh, it asked three key questions. So we were looking primarily at public libraries, <clears throat> but it turns out in the research, there was very little that highlighted anything that was just specific to public libraries that wouldn't have been inclusive of museums, um, academic libraries, just public spaces um, that have both shared um, staff and public areas. So the three questions were, how might the virus spread through general operations? How long does the virus survive on materials and surface surfaces through environmental attenuation? And that's just a fancy way of saying the virus dies out naturally without intervention. So no disinfectants or anything like that. It's just, it's left to, um, to die. Uh, on the material. And then how effective are various prevention and decontamination measures available uh, in the near term? So things like cleaning agents and disinfectants, um, personal protective equipment, face shields, things like that. So these were all focused on the behavior of the virus in the environment and not about the disease. So COVID-19, which occurs after a person has been infected. And these questions, <clears throat> we had the June literature review, and then a second was published in October, which looked as a, at a gap analysis. This, the research on COVID-19 on SARS-CoV-2 has been uh, truly amazing. It's a tsunami of, uh, of research that's been released from so many different countries and trying to sort through it and pull out what is relevant to, to libraries and museums has been a core, core focus of the, the realm research. So I mentioned during the known unknowns about the spread of COVID-19 uh, and it's generally understood to spread primarily through virus containing droplets that are expelled from an infected person. So through sneezes, coughing, speaking, I live in Washington state on the west coast of the United States and we had quite a few cases very early on um, in a church choir um, where people were singing. So a lot of people became infected from that event, um, but those are droplets, right, pass between people. Other possibilities that are shown in the evidence 
are aerosol, aerosolized particles, uh, contaminated objects, which is what we're mostly concerned about with realm. And those are often referred to as a fomite. So once an object has been infected, it's called a fomite and something that's capable of spreading infection. And then other bodily fluids and excretions are also possibilities. Environmental factors such as humidity, temperature, um, and air quality have also been identified as influential in the spread. Uh, one of the things that we've heard from our museum colleagues are concerns about, you know, they keep humidity and temperature relative um, to help protect their collections. And does that play a role? Um, we also have, you know, wildly varying temperatures in, in different countries around the world. And, um, you know, here in the United States, we're entering winter. Much colder temperatures have people spending more time inside. Um, but some of the research that came out through the project shows that colder temperatures do indeed slow down the rate of attenuation of the virus. So it's going to last longer on materials and hotter temperatures um, will make it uh, decay quicker. There's also some evidence that heating, ventilating, <laughs> heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems could contribute to the spread of the virus. So anecdotally, I've heard about people replacing filters on their systems um, to hopefully mitigate the spread um, and capture the virus within the filter on their systems. Um, but there's still a lot more research that needs to happen in all four of these areas. And it's something that we'll continue to be looking into for the project. So on the uh, prevention and decontamination tactics, social distancing is certainly one of the things that we've heard um, really from the beginning along with hand washing is making sure that um, we are cleaning our hands, that we are maintaining distance, wearing a mask, uh, a face covering when we're around others. Um, but other things that have also come up um, are, of course, the use of surface cleaners and disinfectants when it's appropriate and when the material is uh, receptive to that type of treatment. So hard surfaces, um, our phones uh, have been one thing I think people have talked a lot about, but in our buildings, the facilities are key, right? That our handrails, um, computer keyboards, things like that, that are tolerant to disinfectants are something that we can do. And then one that's come up a lot that we've heard questions on uh, are the use of ultraviolet light treatments. Uh, and in October, we had a guest speaker from the Northeast Document Conservation Center, which is located on the east coast of the United States. Um, and provi they provided some background about testing that they had done on uh, the effect of UV light, uh, the effect of heat on cold, on collections. Uh, and that's a webinar that's freely available. NEDCC is also publishing a a leaflet that they make available on these topics. And again, I'll, I'll post some of these links in the chat um, when we're done. Um, but it's a great webinar to check out. Uh, she talks a little bit about things to be uh, mindful of when it comes to using these types of disinfectants. UVA or any type of UV light can help um, accelerate the aging of materials. So we'd wanna be really careful. Um, if it was something that was uh, unique to your collection and not replaceable. And it also, uh, to keep in mind that things like UV light or disinfectants, if you can't get to every page in a book, for example, um, it may just render that type of treatment um, less useful. So I'll dig in a little bit to the lab testing uh, of the project. Um, and the key here was looking at how long the virus would remain active on materials commonly found in libraries, archives, and museums. And I want to <clears throat> clarify that when we say active, all of the virus that we are looking at is viable, infectious, alive. Um, those who have been following res the research may know that there are two types of tests. 
one detects the presence of viral matter, but it doesn't distinguish between active or inactive particles. The other measures infectious viral, viral particles only, and that's what we're doing with the Realm project. So this research is both iterative and cumulative with findings from earlier tests informing successive testing. Um, and we're using that to help uh, inform different directions for the test or different types of materials. To date, we've completed a total of six rounds of testing and each testing round has five materials per round. And the way that the testing works is that the scientists at Patel apply live virus to the materials using a fake spit or synthetic saliva. And those materials are stored uh, in stacked or unstacked configurations. So those stacked configurations you can think of as books on a shelf or books in a book drop, essentially two items stacked together with the virus in between, uh, and they're allowed to dry in that manner. And then they measure the quantity of virus at select time points to capture the attenuation um, or drop in the total virus rate. And we have uh, four time points with each, five if you count um, the first one, which is just measuring it an hour after it's completely dried. But at the start of every test, we have to pick four time points that we're going to look at. So those are defined as the test gets started. So one of the things that has become apparent um, for us as we go through this process is a lot of this science is really uh, very technical. Uh, and one of the things that is technical is the way that uh, the scientists at Patel look at the amount of virus. And so they use a log scale, which is a scientific measurement, um, but it's just a bit difficult for lay people, myself included, to really get the the scale uh, down. So we've, we've talked a lot about the fact that five logs is roughly equal to 100,000 virus cells. Um, and I'm gonna show some charts that um, show the attenuation rate of the virus on the materials. And there are a couple of key time points that we're looking for. The first is the limit of quantitation or LOQ. And what this is, uh, doing is that at this point, the Patel scientists after every, at every test point, they process the materials. And once they're below the limit of quantitation, they have to look through a microscope to determine if there's any virus present. And all they can say at that point is that there's below 26 cells, but above zero, and there is presence. Um, so they don't count the cells individually, they just know that there is virus there, but it's below 26 cells. And we're starting off with close to 100,000. So when we get to below the level of quantitation, we are at 26 or fewer cells. The limit of detection means that the scientists can't find the virus present on any of the coupons. These are just a few images of um, the tests being prepared on the book materials um, at Patel. So you can see they cut them up into small pieces uh, and apply the virus to each of the, the test coupons. So this is the first test that we did for the project. And this was a hardcover book, a paperback book cover, plain paper pages that were closed within a book a plastic protective cover, and a DVD case, which is also made out of plastic. And on the left-hand side of the screen, there is the log scale. And then on the right-hand side of the screen uh, is the, the raw number, which again, for me, it's a lot easier to, to follow along with. It doesn't relate perfectly to the log scale, but it gives you a sense of where things are starting. So we're starting off uh, the inoculum level in this case was over five, and so over 100,000 items or cells. And day zero, and if you look at the bottom of the chart, day zero is really one hour, approximately an hour after the material was applied, the virus was applied and allowed to dry completely. So just by drying completely, 
we went from over a hundred thousand cells to in the neighborhood of you know, like a range of between 12 and 150, um, just by drying for an hour. By day one, there were only two materials that still had virus left on them. And that, that was the plain paper pages that were closed within the book and the plastic protective cover um, that we often use on books uh, in libraries. So that was our very first test. We ran a similar test, uh, test four, and in this test, we stacked the materials. So in test one, the only material that was um, stacked or put between items was those plain paper pages. Um, for test four, we stacked the hardcover book, the soft cover book, the plastic protective cover, and the DVD case. And then we also tested foam material, and it's called um, expanded polyethylene foam, which is very commonly used in museums to uh, support their displays and for shipping. Stacking, again, we started in this case just under 100,000 virus particles. We dropped down to below 10,000, you know, in the neighborhood of looks like around 3,000 3, to just under 1,000 within, uh, within one hour, right? That first hour of drying time. But we, what we saw was a much longer attenuation rate for the materials to the point that everything still had some virus present on it by day six. And remember I mentioned, we pick those time points before testing starts, all the materials are prepared. So we don't know when um, those materials got to below the limit of detection because the test actually stopped on that day. But we were below the limit of quantitation, which remember I said means fewer than 26 cells um, for four of the five items. This is just a visual of comparing uh, the stacked to the unstacked testing. Um, and in all cases, right, we went out to six days at least. Um, we didn't get to below limit of detection, which is why there's a little arrow at the end of day six um, to, to signify that we didn't get um, to below level of detection. Um, there was still a trace amount of virus. These are all of the items that have been tested. And this is one of the resources that's available on the Realm website and that you can download and share. These all have a Creative Commons license applied to them and you can reuse them however um, is useful to you in your work. Um, but we've tested now both synthetic leather or polyvinyl chloride, I think is the um, formal name, as well as a leather book cover. And both of those materials um, had presence of virus out through day eight, which was the furthest time point tested. Um, materials like brass, uh, there, all of the virus was gone by day two. Brass has copper as one of its components, which is shown to have antimicrobial effects, which may be why the virus attenuated so quickly on brass. Um, marble also attenuated very quickly. So uh, these are the items that have tested. We have more items slated to be tested, and those tests are being determined um, by the scientific, working, the scientific working group, an operations working group, and the steering committee for the project. So thinking a little bit about how you can use these results, um, these are just some of the suggestions on how to incorporate Realm into your own local policies and procedures. Every community is going to do things differently and there be like one of the things we talk a lot about here is that if your community has a very high infection rate compared to you know, a community 100 kilometers or miles away, um, you may choose very different policies and procedures um, because you're just facing a different set of circumstances. Um, but thinking and staying on top of the local guidelines that are being issued, um, what requirements are there on using PPE and what recommendations um, are there about hand washing or using hand sanitizer. Um, 
consider if your collection or resources can be sanitized without damage. Um, a lot of times this is the physical building can be sanitized and wiped down with disinfectants um, if you have the public and even your staff still in the building. If you're choosing to quarantine uh, items, look at the realm results, um, the lifespan of the virus on materials. Uh, we have heard a, a massive range of quarantine um, hours from one day up through five days. It really depends. And one of the things that we are encouraging people to do is to take the realm results to a local health department, provincial health department, whoever you've been working with um, and getting information from and sharing what you know about the materials through realm and what thoughts they have and how you can inform your own local policies. Um, asking your peer institutions what they're doing is always a great uh, way to, to help reinforce some of your thinking or uh, introduce new things that you hadn't considered. And then making sure you inform both your internal and external stakeholders of the policies that you're coming up with. We've actually created a toolkit in on the Realm site that pulls together some of these facts. These are primarily US-based resources because the project is based in the US, but a lot of the guidance is also broad in terms of suggestions and considerations that you might want to make. So on the Realm website, uh, you're going to find a range of toolkit research resources rather, um, all of the project research and test results are available, including all of the raw data. Um, we are trying to be as transparent as possible with the research that's available. Um, so you're, you're free to use it, you're free to share it, um, however it might support you. Um, we've also collected a series of frequently asked questions uh, that we've heard through the project that may be helpful as you are making considerations. And those questions were formed because we've been inviting questions from the public. So there is on the Realm website an opportunity to submit a question to the project team. You have me here today, so I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have that I can answer. But you can also submit a question if something comes to you in the next day or weeks, and we'll be here to answer those. I also encourage you to sign up for the email updates that are issued by the project. Those uh, are going out maybe one or two per month uh, about what's happening with the project whenever we make a new release. Those are published um, and we give people a heads up through the email. So I suggest you sign up for those as well and you'll see the option to subscribe when you're on the website. All right. That is the end of the formal part of the presentation. I'm going to stop the screen share um, and I'll be ready to take uh, your questions. All right. Okay, so thank you very much, Kendra. That was that was fantastic. It's such a, I, I, I know that at IFLA we've been lucky to be involved in the steering committee and watch the mm -hmm. pro the whole program develop and evolve as time goes along and 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 broaden the insights that you get together. But it's great to actually have it all just condensed down in this way. I think in particular the what you were saying at the beginning about this question of how we deal with uncertainty and how we can actually use these results is 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 it, it, i think it's incredibly it's incredibly useful it's incredibly valuable for people hopefully um i've got a couple of short questions that i have but obviously i wanted to open the floor first to our attendees um as kendra said of course there is the possibility to ask questions subsequently by by email and to sign up to the newsletter um but i'll give people just a few seconds if you want to add in any questions do use the questions and answer function and i'm just going to keep popping in a few Great. of the resources yeah, no, that i mentioned i'll, 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 give, I'll yeah. give people a moment to think just <laughs>
this, this is a relatively experimental time for us to do webinars because we're assuming that it should be a good time for Asia, but it's quite early in the morning for quite a lot of people in Asia. <laughs> Well, I suppose actually. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and start? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I was going to ask one question. I, I, I'd be fascinated. You mentioned that one of your recommendations is that libraries should take the results and actually share them with their local health authorities and share them with peer institutions and parent institutions. What are you seeing amongst amongst as far as as far as you actually have information? What are you seeing? Uh, amongst these government institutions, parent institutions, in terms of how they're welcoming the results, how they're using them. Clearly, you're, you're working very closely with IMLS, which is the US government agency for libraries and museums. But I'd be interested to hear what other examples you have and what other experience of, of the responses that you have. Uh, I would say, anecdotally, from a few of every, uh, in the United States, every state has what they refer to as a state library, an administrative agency that helps to uh, manage things that are, are impactful to libraries across. They help manage funding that comes from IMLS. Several of them have taken the Realm research and shared it with a state health department and said, hey, this is actually going on that's specific to our field. Can you take a look at it and let us know um, your interpretation and how we can use this data? And one, it opens up, you know, it's providing, it's making sure that these people at the health department know that this is something that's keenly uh, important to the library community is how can we safely handle materials uh, or what should be top of mind as we make considerations about how to do this. And, and in the cases where people have shared it, uh, I think they've had very positive uh, interactions with the health department and, you know, like, thanks for sharing this. Here's how we're interpreting it and and what we think is is could work well for you um, and providing that type of, of local guidance based on their local rules. So, so far, it seems like it's gone well when people have have been able to take that step. Thank you. And uh, I know from experience at IFLA, we were very much tracking the responses that different national library fields were taking as we went through with this. And I think you said that quarantine periods range from one day to five days. We saw a number mm -hmm. of countries saying two weeks mm -hmm. yeah. where they effectively yeah. sort of added together all the different options. And but you could feel very much that everyone was in the dark a little bit and just feeling around and having yeah. to make that balance between what the science said and what we knew and what we didn't know, but also just the desire simply to keep people as safe as possible, mm -hmm. but also simply the practicalities of how long can you quarantine a library collection before <laughs> the library gets full of quarantine books and no one can actually yeah. use it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I'll give people another couple of questions. I, I, I've got a couple more, but I obviously don't want to sort of hog the, <laughs> hog the floor here. Well, until they come in, go ahead and keep going yeah. and we'll, we have time to get to them. That's fine. So I guess the second question, this is more on the practical side. When we're talking about quarantining, um, there's, I don't know, there's, there's different guidance out there. There's one of my favorite ones comes from, came from a library in Egypt where simply it was a public library. So the books weren't particularly valuable in themselves. Their form of quarantining was to go out and leave the books in the sun. Mm -hmm. and, and they had a big outdoor space, there's quite a lot of space in Egypt, and so they could just do that. Um, what, as far as you're aware, do the results of, of, of realms so far indicate in terms of how best to do quarantining, in terms of laying books out? Clearly, as you said, stacking may risk the virus lasting longer, re reducing the attenuation rate. So that's that's the biggest takeaway that that we found was that stacking does decrease the attenuation rate, but it really kept it at a level that was traced, so below the limit of quantitation, so below 26 cells um, in a droplet, which is, you know, that's very, very few. But it was, you know, we've had some people like, should I be putting these out on the table, fanned open? And it's not 
you know, very practical than most of our institutions to be able to do that. So most people that we have heard, they're in large bins uh, and have uh, art, they put a date on them like these were collected on December 1, return to circulation December 10, whatever makes the most sense. But uh, mostly it sounds like people are using bins, boxes. Um, a lot of these institutions aren't open to the public now, so it might give them a little bit more room, but even having the, the space to put them into in boxes and, you know, at, at a large public library, you're talking about thousands of items being returned every day. So it, it is a considerable issue to, to be faced with. Thank you. And I, I know for as of four and a quarter hours ago in the Netherlands, where, I, where we're based at IFLA, libraries have been stuck back to click and collect so i imagine there are lots of sort of reading spaces and circulating spaces yeah. that are, are now going to be full of boxes um <clears throat> i just one more bid to people in the our attendees please do use the questions and answers function if you do have any particular questions it's true the amount of information that you shared kendra's been I know I was going through and trying to think of questions and then you kept on answering them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's always a bit of a challenge when you're trying to moderate these things when the presentation is so comprehensive that you cover everything. I suppose what, no, what, what, one final question for me was almost, I said, well, I don't know, it's a part A and a part B question. It's firstly, where have the surprises been as you've moved ahead with this? Um, to the extent that you can be surprised when you're actually expecting uncertainty, but also then what's the next big question? What, what's, what's the next big focus, given mm -hmm. that we're in a phase where we have obviously vaccines coming, fortunately, but there's still a lot of uncertainty about opening, closing, opening, closing. Well, I think we'll start with the second part. And I think that the vaccine issue is going to be a big one with institutions as they think about how that impacts their staff, uh, how, how common it becomes, the, the vaccination rates in any particular community, and how does that impact the decisions that we can make about our public spaces. So I do think that that's going to be a very large conversation that is not going to be unique to libraries, that that is going to impact our schools, it's going to impact travel, um, so many things that, uh, that I don't think we've quite wrapped our heads around what it looks like. We're just getting to the point, um, you know, here in the US, the first vaccine started being administered. I think the UK was a bit ahead, which is fantastic. I mean, it's, it's such a milestone moment to be able to get from where we started, you know, in March, for most of most countries uh, in March, others in December of last year, um, to come this far in a year is just really amazing. But I, I think that there are going to be some very big questions um, that impact uh, and continue to challenge um, decision making. Um, there's still going to be a lot of of known unknowns. In terms of surprises with the research, uh, the stacking was a surprise to the researchers at Battelle. And it turns out that that is not a common way to test anything in the scientific community. So we, there has been a lot of research published, and this is all in the literature review. We've collected all the citations from the research that we included in the literature review. There's a lot of research going on on everyday objects that we touch. So banknotes is a really good example, right? Several researchers have looked at how long the virus lasts on banknotes. They weren't testing it stacked, which is exactly how you would find them in a wallet or a billfold. So that was really interesting to them as scientists to say, hey, this makes a big difference in, in how long the virus might last. Um, so things like that, uh, I guess it was, it, you know, they were certainly interested um, from a science perspective, and it was very relevant to, to our constituents to be able to, to say that this is going to make a difference as you consider your policies. Thank you. Um, I admit we haven't yet got any additional questions in. I think what I suggest we do actually is uh, we have all of the, the links that you've posted up in the chat now. Um, 
And what we'll also do is, if that's okay with you, excellent, perfect. <laughs> We've got that there. What I might actually then do is I will add the links that you've posted up in the chat into mm -hmm. onto the event page on the IFLA website so that people can look down and they can actually they, 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 they can click down, see what's available and actually sign up and of course follow up with you directly. Um, we are doing a, a second one of these webinars. We're doing it at a very different time zone. It'll be at um, five o'clock Central European time. So that's 8 a.m. in the morning for you. Um, and that's going to be more focused on the Americas. I, I imagine, obviously, that people who are based to the east of Europe may slightly hesitate to turn up for something <laughs> late in the evening, but that, that, that's how it works. Um, we will also be putting up a recording of this webinar so that people can listen in and, and, and pick up on it. But obviously, there's so much great material already on the OCLC Realm website, so you can already go and look at that. So I think with that, I will probably actually close the webinar now and thank everyone for, for, for dialing in for, from wherever you are. And obviously thank Kendra very much for such a, a fantastic clear presentation. And of course, both to Kendra and to all the colleagues at OCLC for doing all this work that's really helping not provide 100% certainty, but actually reduce uncertainty and provide an evidence base for decision making, which is it's, it's super valuable right now. Thank you, Stephen. I appreciate the time. Thank you very much. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. And have a good rest of the day.